Hello everybody, welcome back and today I'm going to chat through The Marriage Portrait by Maggie O'Farrell which of course has been was shortlisted for this year's Women's Prize for fiction and this is only the second book that I've read of Maggie's, the first being Hamnet which won the 2020 Women's Prize for fiction and I adored this as much as I adored Hamnet. Maggie's ability to take women who are considered unusual or a little bit uncertain in society supposedly based on true stories but you know blowing open gaps in our knowledge and our understanding to create and develop fascinating characters in torturous circumstances and the marriage portrait is no difference it's fantastic and even more impressively it's unexpected okay so who do we have at the center of our story is a very young woman girl when we first meet her called lucretia lucretia is the daughter of a very powerful florentine duke in renaissance italy and such is the ways of european power politics at the time that she is betrothed in a way that ensures her father's power and constant favor with amongst the feuding states around that time in what was to become italy she's married off at a very young age to the duke of ferrer alfonso however as did actually happen lucretia died only a couple of years after marrying the duke the Duke famously then went on to marry Lucretia Borgia and so on. However, rather than take the more familiar character of Lucretia Borgia, who herself has many gossipy, incorrect stories written about her, um, Maggie has decided to focus on the first wife, this extremely young girl who died soon after getting married. Now at the time, and as is known through various gossipy European court circles at the time and since, there were rumours that this young Lucretia was actually killed uh, just soon after her marriage for reasons that will become clear or for reasons that Mag Maggie wants to interrogate. And so she's taken this little anecdote in European history in Renaissance Italy to bring to life a young girl, a, a sort of unusual coming of age story where this young privileged girl who's had a very sheltered life in a rich Florentine court is married off and in doing so exposed to the world of power politics, the patriarchy, brutality, um, and comes to understand where her worth fights the, fights the way society has deemed that her only worth is whether or not she gives birth to a son, therefore bringing an heir to her new husband. Lucretia is a fascinating character that Maggie's brought to life. Yes, she's sheltered, but she's unusual. She's willful, yet also naive. She's beautifully talented artistically, but utterly um, unable to pursue her talents, which are evident to all around her. She is a pawn in the power machinations of her powerful father, who knows that a a fruitful marriage arrangement is the only thing that matters uh, for his daughter's future. And Julie arranges a marriage to a young Duke, Duke Alfonso of Ferreira, a man who has recently come to the dukedom after the death of his father. However, when Lucretia marries this man, Alfonso, she is exposed to a hostile court in another city that she's never visited. She has to learn to navigate family politics as well as external politics and the politics of the court in Renaissance Italy at the time. And it's really interrogating that gap between what Lucretia knows and what Lucretia assumes is happening. So, as I said, in history, it is known that Lucretia, the first wife of the Duke of Ferrer, died not soon after getting married to Alfonso. And it was rumored at the time that she may have been murdered but the, tr the story was at the time that she died of a fever, uh, which was not unusual at the time either. So Maggie's like, okay, I'm going to blow open that gap and interrogate why a young girl would be murdered, assume, let's say that she was murdered. Why would she be murdered two years after marrying her husband? Or did she actually die of a fever? And how Maggie does this, is through this wonderful character of Lucretia, we get to see the lot of women where their only power, their only source of power, is in the ability to bring heirs to their husband. 
but also how that is a double-edged sword and one that they could end up falling on. But also in Lucretia, she wants to bring alive the idea of an unreliable narrator. So in Lucretia, we have this very spirited young girl with a feverish imagination. And therefore, what Maggie does is she plays up Lucretia's feverish imagination and this sort of perhaps does she spring to conclusions too quickly to interrogate whether Lucretia actually has a fever that she dies from. But does she only believe that her husband's going to kill her because she is eccentric and prone to flights of fancy rather than able to see that she is actually extremely ill from a fever? What I loved most about this is how those tectonic plates of an unreliable narrator are built and developed throughout this book. You are never on completely sure ground with Maggie. You know, one minute you're thinking, gosh, Alfonso, her husband's really quite kind. Then it flips. Then you think, oh, actually, Lucretia is unwell. And then you think, no, no, actually, I believe her. I believe her. And it's constantly that very gentle flux that is the real achievement of this book, um, as well as Maggie's ability to deliver what you think, but not how you expect. So yeah, deliver what you want, but not how you expect it. That is Maggie's uh, a real achievement in this book. Lucretia is an incredible character and uh, she really comes alive. Um, and I love the way that Maggie has taken this political court or courts of Florence and Ferrara. And instead of focusing on the men that rule them, Maggie has brought to life the women that have to navigate them, both in terms of Lucretia, her mother, as well as her new sisters-in-law that also su um, suffer with having to, wanting to bring alive their own hopes and dreams and ambitions. If you are nervous that a book sent uh, set in Renaissance Italy, uh, for example, that kind of era of courts, European power politics, huge cast of characters. This isn't going to be like um, Hilary uh, Mantle's Woolful Trilogy. It's not that dense and the cast of characters isn't that big. Instead, Maggie fo focuses on a far narrower cast of characters with a um, uh, real light touch. There's a lot of deft touches. The reason why this book is called The Marriage Portrait is because at the centre of it is a portrait that the Duke commissions for his new wife. What is really interesting is how this becomes a sort of allegory for what is a lot of what is going on in these Florentine courts. Because as you can imagine, the great portraits of the time, even if you look at Tudor portraits today, they all sort of either showing power and privilege and wealth. That was the idea of having your portrait painted. And so there is this great gap that starts to build up between how much is the illusion of what needs to be presented of this powerful young girl, young bride, but also the powerlessness of her life, um, actually, in reality. I adored this book. There are moments where it's sad, but Maggie O'Farrell really carries you through that, and you really feel for Lucretia as a young woman with, with hope and uh, with verve, and that is a fantastic achievement. Uh, it is big, you will fly through it, it's a masterpiece. And the, the finale, because you're like, is she gonna be killed? Is, is she right? Is she murdered? Or does she die from fever? You'll have to read to find out. Maggie O'Farrell's Fantastic, The Marriage Portrait.